Hi, my name is Deborah. Welcome to yet another episode of Screwed by Rockland County Courts. Welcome. Before we continue, I would like to reiterate there are many highly respected judges and attorneys. My experience over the last five and a half years is what I will be going over during my webisodes and the attorneys and the judges that I mention are what went on during my case and how they handled it. I would like to continue where we left off. We left off where Honorable Judge Victor Alfieri Jr. decided to close my case for the best interest of his career. My case at that time was three years old. After he closed my case, which he clarified on the record, which I read to you during the last webisode, he was going to give that 30 days. Um, he never gave me the 30 days. So I would like to read the order that Judge Alfieri issued um, when closing my case, which is a false order. This is the decision and order. The plaintiff, who is me, moves to restore the, with, the within matter to the court's calendar. The defendant opposes. The papers on which this court has considered are as follows. Plaintiff's order to show cause. He uses as example one. During this time, when we came into court, it was very clear that Judge Alfieri never read my papers. I will later provide further proof to this. Going forward, he used defendant's affidavit in opposition, again, to make his decision to close my case. Again, he did not read these papers, and he actually did not even have them in his possession that day, and his clerk was going to go looking for them. The plaintiff's motion is denied, and he uses Law 3404. This matter has been inactive for more than two years. The case has been deemed abandoned. The plaintiff's motion is denied without prejudice to start a new action. This decision shall constitute an order of this court, and it is signed by Victor J. Alferi, Jr., Acting Supreme Court Justice, on January 6, 2014, never giving me the 30 days that he so stated on the record. After this took place, I did file a new divorce action, which was quite costly, and I did appear in front of Judge Alfieri. Unfortunately, I had to appeal his decision. What he was doing was wrong. I had spent a huge amount of money over the three years when he decided to close my case for the best interest of his career. I did appear in front of him um, with my new divorce action, something that appears regularly in Judge Alfieri's courtroom is that he doesn't have a lot of recall. Um, he doesn't recall who you are. He doesn't recall his decisions. Um, he overturns his decisions. He doesn't read papers. Um, I have emails even from my attorney, which states when he goes in front of him that he will not accept any motions, documents that are over three inches thick. What goes on inside of Victor Alfieri's courtroom is something that is very important to get out there. Um, I was, again, going a little bit back, I was forced to file for divorce again, and I was also forced to appeal. I would like to share parts of my appeal with you and start off with the brief. I think this will help you better understand to what was actually going on. So let's start with the Questions presented. One, may a judge dismiss a case for personal gain to avoid embarrassment, personal benefit, maintain his standing as a Supreme Court judge, or simply to keep his job? Two, may this case remain in front of Judge Alfieri? And three, should venue remain in Rockland County? Statement of this case. I'm skipping on to what's important that I'd like you to hear. What makes this case ripe for appeal is the Supreme Court's reasoning for marking the case as abandoned. Upon submission of the application to place the matter back on the court's calendar, the judge spoke to counsel in chambers. Therein, without reading the papers, he simply stated, given the age of the case, I am deeming it abandoned. Your affirmant attempted to point out the monthly correspondence I had sent to opposing counsel since being retained, but the court did not care. 
There were other colloquially, but the transcript after the meeting in chambers speaks for itself. I ask this court to note that with, notwithstanding this matter has been outstanding since 2010. The beginning of the December 2000 transcript reads like a comedy. The clerk has no notice of appearances since 2010. The court believed the parties were already divorced. And notwithstanding that there was an outstanding order to show cause, which my, cli my client paid to have prepared, filed, served, etc., the court did not have it, nor knew anything of, it, of the issues. Clearly, the court never read the papers and directed a conference in chambers. After the conference, wherein the moving papers were never read, the opposition papers were served late, pursuant to the order to show cause. In fact, they were served on the appearance date, allowing me no chance to reply. Those papers were not read as well. The court did not give plaintiff appellant the time he promised to refile. The new action was initiated out of abundance of caution, yet the above cited statements demonstrate that the court was acting out of self-interest and not in the interest of justice. Regardless of the prejudice caused to my client by having to redo three years of a divorce, the cost of having the attorney for the children reappointed, the cost and trauma to my client and her children for a new forensic examination, the court refused to award attorney fees to my client nor pro rata costs for the forensics and the attorney for the children. The court refused to take into account that my client is a full-time homemaker raising children and thus does not have income. Instead, the court based his decision upon my 50-year-old female client's life savings. Moreover, the court ignored the fact that her spouse is making claims to whatever money my client may have. Additionally, the court ignored the fact that her spouse himself has over a certain amount in claimed assets, um, which I'm not disclosing, um, as I had mentioned in my first episode for privacy, and earns approximately per year. Put another way, in two years, her spouse can earn more money than my client will ever see. Once my client's money is gone, it is gone. Her spouse will continue to earn his income, and they give the amount. Where is the substantial justice? These issues are without the scope of this application. The original action clearly should not have been dismissed. This is due to the fact that it was dismissed not out of, out of any theory of law, to wit, plaintiff's failure to move the case. Moreover, if this action was not stayed, he may have well gotten away with stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars. He still may. As detailed above, the trial court put his interests above those of his sworn duty. A police officer is an officer of the law. An attorney is an officer of the court. A judge is the court. He or she is the law. A judge can take a person's freedom, money, children, homes, property, life savings, pets, and in rare cases, a person's life. Such a person may not, must not, place his or her career or own well-being above his or her duty. If the court can mark a case off his calendar, because it enhances his career, why can he not rule a certain way on a case to make certain people happy? But then, why cannot a police officer shade the truth just a little, perjury, to enhance his career? Why cannot a police officer take 10,000 just to be sure not to be patrolling a certain corner of the Bronx at night? Why then cannot an attorney tell just a little white lie to the court to help his client's case? Or why cannot an attorney tell the client that he spent nine hours working on the client's matter when the attorney only spent one hour. The list can go on and on. It is endless. I just shared a small portion of the brief that goes along with my appeal. This gives you um, a perspective from an officer of the court and what Judge Alfieri did to me. And um, it is really very disturbing um, that this all took place. And for all those who are familiar with the courts, um, if you are left to appeal just because a judge is allowed to remain on the bench, making inappropriate decisions, not reading legal documents, going behind closed doors and speaking, and he just feels 
he could just do whatever he wants. Um, what about people who can't afford to appeal? And um, just to be put in the position as I am now, um, I won the appeal. And although I won the appeal, the appeals court is still putting me back in front of Judge Alfieri. Unfortunately, my attorney did not um, go to the lower court first and ask him to recuse himself. So I am left to go back in front of Judge Alfieri. And my attorney, with his advice, is telling me that I go to trial in front of him, that Judge Alfieri will make mistakes, and that it is better to appeal the whole trial than to do it in piecemeal. That if I put a motion into the court to ask Judge Alfieri to recuse himself, and he denies that, it would put me in position to appeal his denial to come off my case, even though I feel he will prejudice me. The main issues for this court to decide is, one, was the trial court correct in dismissing a three-year-old case out of either fear of some sort of reprisal from his superiors or due to a perceived benefit? Two, were this court to say no and demand the case back to the original trial court with instructions to proceed with the 2010 case, could the acting judge, Alfieri, conduct such a trial in a fair and impartial manner consistent with the law and ethical standards of the judiciary? Three, can Deborah receive a fair trial in Rockland County regardless of which judge presides over her case? So before I end today, I would like to thank you again for joining me and I hope you will continue to tune in and there's a lot more of this coming. Please follow me on Facebook, Screwed by Rockland Quartz. Subscribe to my Screwed by Rockland Quartz YouTube channel, Twitter at Screw Rock Law, and on my website, ScrewedByRocklandQuartz.com. If you would like to email me, I can also be reached at ScrewedByRocklandQuartz at gmail.com.